watch this. We may go through all of this and spend billions of dollars and not get the results that we want. Conservationists are celebrating a big win after the federal government released their $1 billion 10-year plan to save and recover salmon and steelhead populations in the Salmon River. But the other side is worried about how this will impact farming. The Idaho Steelheads hockey team had a huge win on the ice Wednesday night, a game-winning goal in overtime. But it was a goal back in the second period that had added meaning. The first In-N-Out restaurant opening in Idaho caused chaos, and you were all quick to comment on such chaos. We're going to go through your favorites from frenzies over the fast food. A leak in the plans didn't breach the process, but it might be a step towards breaching the lower Snake River dams entirely. We previously reported about leaked federal documents that outline the federal government's supposed plan to restore local salmon and steelhead fish populations. And conservationists say this is an outline that the foundation for a future without the SNA, the Snake River Dams. It would take studies, alternative energy sources, and a lot of money. But some say the consequences are too big to shoulder. Andrew Bartline shares the story. world of commerce you're seeing the water stakeholders and business you're seeing the ag stakeholders runs tight the power stakeholders on time which is why our stakeholders have some serious concerns with what's been announced here with this uh, new agreement jason mercier so advocates on their behalf which in turn puts him in opposition to the newly announced federal government's position well, even if we do this not going to be guaranteed those returns. The feds officially published their plan to recover the shrinking salmon and steelhead populations. In total, it asked to earmark $1 billion to lay the foundation for a future without the lower Snake River dams. And we have not seen an appetite in Congress to do so. The funds are intended to supplement hatchery operations, create alternative energy sources, and study the lateral impacts. On the economic side, the consequences are substantial. The plan is part of a settlement and ongoing litigation between the feds and local tribes partnered with numerous conservationist groups. You are going to impact agriculture if you drop that water table and we're a big ag producing area. You're going to put significant pressure on the transportation sector if you're taking all of that commodities off of barges and putting them onto the trucks on the roads. Unfortunately, this does not even settle the litigation. It just puts it on hold for 10 years. But 10 years time? is all too routine to this team. We and others have been suing the federal government for 25 years. Mitch Cutter mm -hmm. is part of a decades-long push sure. advocating for a full breach. We have a limited amount of time to do that, something like two generations of Chinook salmon, which are about four years each, so eight years total. There's a consensus of salmon biologists that agree that we are on this extinction pathway. But ask around. It's not the first time Jason's heard it. In 1996, the advocates for tearing down the dam took out a full-page ad in the New York Times. The salmon would be extinct if the dams were not removed. They said it happened by 2017. I think we still have salmon here in 2023. Populations of Chinook and several of the populations of steelhead here in the state are already at quasi-extinction thresholds. That means fewer than 50 fish returning to an individual stream in any given year. A landslide could take that population out. Um, a wildfire could take that population out and from a place where it's existed for thousands of years. But both sides agree our modern way of life depends on the dams. Energy, transportation, irrigation services, people rely on those things. All services the feds are prepared to replace and no matter what side you ask, dam breaching is inevitable. It's just a matter of time. So this could start all over again in 10 years. And if these are federally authorized dams. Nothing is going to be happening to them without an act of Congress. Governor Brad Little also weighed in on the agreement, writing in part, quote, instead of working together to find common ground, the signatories to the agreement pandered to their political supporters and paid no attention to the real impacts dam removal would have on Idahoans. He said, we believe authors of this deal are genuine in their desire to do what they believe is right for constituents. Unfortunately, it appears they only listen to a select few constituents in the region while disregarding many. The top concern of the Mountain State's Policy Center and also mentioned by the governor too, revolves around what's called baseload power. It's the bare minimum needed to support the power grid. And while conservationists argue hydropower is a smaller percentage of our regional grid, 
MSPC says it's reliable and often a barrier against rolling blackouts or can be if needed, I should say. But as the Biden administration has outlined, Joe, mm -hmm. this document is preparing for a potential future where eliminating uh, or I guess breaching the dams would be the right verb to use is a possibility. If Congress so chooses to do so, they want to be prepared to make that happen and fill those gaps that the dams currently fill. It's very interesting when you, when you bring us these stories, because admittedly, I don't know a lot about this, and I feel like a lot of Idahoans don't know a lot about this, but it's a very intricate issue that people should study up, as you highlighted. It impacts every Idahoan's life every single day. Yeah, and it's, it's difficult, too, to where it's like, well, this government study says that the dams are the reason the fish are dying. Yeah. And then somebody just says, well, I disagree with that. I think it's this reason. And so... It's tough when somebody says this is the reason and then the opposition just says, no, it's not. I don't know where you go from there, but the position of the federal government right now is they're interested in potentially removing the dams. Okay, well, we'll follow this one closely. I know there's a lot of input on both sides, a lot of cases to be made. Thank you, Andrew Bartline, for digging into a tough story. Appreciate it. All right, it's a hockey night tonight. The Idaho Steelheads will take on the Rapid City Rush, game two of their three-game weekend set. And the Steelheads, they had a massive win Wednesday night. Captain A.J. White had an overtime winner. But was a goal that was scored back in the second period of Wednesday night's game that had the most meaning? Professional hockey can take you places you never imagined. Just ask Chicago native Willie Neerham. I, I never thought I'd be here, um, you know, but uh, like I said before, it's it's... I'm glad I'm here. It's been a blessing ever since um, I've arrived, and um, I'm happy I'm here. Neerham started with the Idaho Steelheads in 2022 after playing for Arizona State at the NCAA level. He joined an Idaho team that went on to have a record-breaking year as a team, a team that came up just short of a Kelly Cup championship. It's, it's an expectation at this point to, to just do well, to win games, to sweep weekends, to go on the road, sweep weekends. Um, you know, and I think that you know, we've done a pretty good job of, of staying level-headed and, and staying even keel, um, you know, even through the ups and downs. The talented forward rejoined the campaign for the Cup this week, scoring a crucial goal in a tight game against Rapid City. You know, followed up the play with the, with the rebound goal to, to tie that too, and, you know, that was uh, a huge weight lifted off my shoulders, especially coming back after missing 15 games. I was home, uh, you know, I had to take care of a, a few things. My November 1st, my, my dad passed away unexpectedly, and... It rocked our family pretty hard. Neerham says it was his dad that got him into hockey. They shared a love of the game and the Chicago Blackhawks. Looking back, Neerham knows his dad helped his journey through hockey greatly. Putting in the overtime at work so he could afford an extra pair of skates to me when they, you know, when they broke down or another stick or, you know, him rushing home from work, tired, you know, and, and then driving me right to, right to practice, which was, you know, 45 minutes to an hour away. He went above and beyond for me, you know, just making sure I was taken care of, making sure my family was taken care of and, you know, really giving me a life that I love living now, so. Returning to hockey took a back seat for a time, but Neerham says he knew he had his hockey family waiting for him in Boise. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be back playing if it wasn't for all the support and then that everyone helped me with. Wednesday night against Rapid City was an emotional return after a month away, but it was a sweet return. At 6.58 of the second period, Willie Neerham knocked home a game-tying goal. You know, I kind of looked up to the sky and just kind of chuckled. It wasn't, a, it wasn't a pretty goal. It was a little bit of a lucky bounce, too, I'd say, off, off their, their goalie and in. So I knew I had a little help on that. I felt it on the ice, too. I felt a bunch of guys, you know, after you score, you, you celebrate and, you know, you huddle up a little bit. But that one felt a little bit more, a little bit tighter, you know, I, you know. Um, I know a few guys grabbed me and, and grabbed me pretty tight there and, and cuts quick at the puck for me and that's sitting in my dresser at home now. The 25-year-old winger will forever have a special bond with his father. They share the same name. I'm named after him. No, that's, that's something I, I, take, I take pride in. Uh, I was named after my dad and no matter what happens, you know, what happens from now on, you know, he, he lives on through me, through all the lessons he's taught me, through all the things that he's done for me, but through, through my name as well. And you know, that's, I want to make him proud. And Playing with a heavy heart adds a layer of complexity to hockey, but Neerham says the support from the entire Idaho Steelheads family makes all the difference. I'm blessed to play this game for a living. Um, I'm blessed to be around people who, you know, share the same passion as me and, and you know, Love and support me, you know, and, and, and we love and support every single one of, one of the guys in the locker room. So I think, you know, going to war and going to battle with everyone tonight will just be, uh, you know, another, another blessing. So. 
And you can watch Niram and the rest of the Idaho Steelheads play tonight at 7. Idaho takes on the Rapid City Rush, game two of the weekend set. You can't make it in person to the Idaho Central Arena, and boy, you got to get down there for a game. You can watch the game tonight on Idaho's very own 24-7 at 7.2 over the air. Again, thank you to Willie Niram for his time here this afternoon. All right, we're getting you ready for the weekend with some events in today's 411. Here's my esteemed colleague, Morgan Romero. Someone painted a beautiful mural over the hole in Boise Bicycle Project's wall. It says the 2023 Holiday Kids Bike Giveaway. Just in time, too, because the giveaway is tomorrow from 9 to 5. If you want to help out, they still need volunteers. Head to Boise Bicycle Project's website to find out more. Want to see Santa? The Idaho Educational Services for the Deaf and Blind are hosting their annual Signing Santa event tomorrow from 10 until 2. It's at the Idaho State Museum in downtown Boise. This event is mainly for kids, elementary age and younger, who are deaf and hard of hearing. You can register at myiesdb.org or scan the QR code on your screen. Still need to do some holiday shopping? This Sunday is the Sagebrush Collaborative Sustainable Holiday Market featuring over 35 local and regional artists selling handmade goods. Head to the Linen Building in Boise from 9 to 5 for last minute gifts, festive drinks and coffee. Plus, the Idaho Conservation League will wrap your gifts for free in sustainable wrapping paper. That's the 411 on the 208. I'm Morgan Romero. Before it happened, there was a lot of speculation and anticipation for the opening of In-N-Out Burger here in Idaho. Back in 2020, the family-owned burger chain made it be known that they had plans to open in Idaho, a location within five years. And since then, it's been a flash-fried fever for animal-style fries, quadruple stack burgers being closer than a four-hour, four-and-a-half-hour drive from the Treasure Valley. Then, this past Tuesday, it finally happened. Store number 400 opened, making Idaho the eighth state to welcome the popular fast food chain. Speculation was correct. The parking lot at the Village at Meridian became a frenzy for fried food. And Brian Holmes was there for it. In case you missed it, here's probably one of the most talked about stories of the year in this week's callback. <laughs> The busiest intersection in Idaho. Already moving slow, Eagle Road at the Village in Meridian. Just got a bit busier. They are directing traffic into the parking lot there. Expect delays. Delays on the drive. Looks like that may be a concern all day today. Are nothing compared to the standstill in the parking lot. With cars collecting eight deep in anticipation of the opening of Idaho's first in and out. Probably a couple hundred at least. Bill Davis, <laughs> he got here early. You've been here since noon yesterday. Yeah to get a hamburger. Yep. So he isn't that far back in line. And you're number two. Number two, yep. For a hamburger, that's number one in his mind. Every time we fly down to California, first thing is in and out. Every time we leave California, 
in and out, and then catch a flight. Bill has patiently waited for a while. I've waited 25 years for this. So what's a few more hours? It's just a hamburger. It's, it's what a hamburger's all about. <laughs> Spending the night in his truck in order to be one of the first to order a double-double. 20 years down the road when I'm in my walker, I could say, you know, I was the number two there. <laughs> then finally. All right, that first car is coming now. Just before 9 a.m. <laughs> I'm sending cars. The final approach begins. Oh. To understand the fanfare for animal style burgers and fries, it helps to see it, to believe it. Where it's not just the people who dress up for the occasion. My wife made this for a children's Halloween costume. My daughter wore this one, my son wore this one. Meanwhile, the line to get in is well out the door. And where we find Sydney and Robert. No more Utah trips. No more Utah trips. <laughs> who just got off the night shift. Had to come here? Yeah. <laughs> Sydney says the grub is great, but she's really here for her mom, an in and out fan who passed away kind of, six years yeah. ago. It's like a little memorial thing. We do something special every year for her birthday. So we're doing this this year. What was your mom's favorite? My mom used to like to do a double double animal style and french fries and a strawberry milkshake. So you gotta get that. Possibly, possibly. The line to get in. I don't think anyone realizes how fast they get you in and out of here. Is nowhere near as long as the line of cars. Two double doubles, animal style. Best friend Caleb and Caitlin from CUNA are so close. Yeah, so far. <laughs> but they've been in line since 4 a.m. Why? I came because she's my best friend and wanted in. <laughs> I've never had in and out before, so this will be my first time. Waiting for five and a half hours for food she's never had. I hope I like it. I hope it's worth the wait. Bill Boyles, he knows it is. Yeah, it's just so exciting to be here in, in Idaho. Because Bill used to work at in and out in high school. 396 stores ago. <laughs> We've been waiting a long time. We've been in Idaho 48 years, and we have been waiting for in and out to come here. For Bill Davis and his kids. Hi, how are you guys? Good, good, how are you? Their wait is also over. That's double double, cheese burgers, and the fries. Here are those four burgers for you. OK, thank you. Oh, man. Back out in the parking lot. Go down the stop sign, make a left. I think it's a left. The line. OK, yeah, yeah baby, we're let's excited. go. Boys, you got in and out. Getting a little longer. You got some time on your hands today? Yeah, we do now. <laughs> Eric Lynn didn't give it much thought before he drove down here. It's going to be a bit. But he's not worried about it. Well, I, I got to let my boss know, but. <laughs> Are you missing work? A little bit. <laughs> they don't know. They have no idea. <laughs> and soon, in a matter of hours, Eric and everyone else several lots away will experience what Bill um. already is. It's real. The euphoria of an in and out double double. Oh, dude. I'm not going According to the Idaho Statesman on Tuesday, by noon on opening day, the wait at the drive through was up to eight hours. The traffic controllers, they told our team they plan to be there until at least January 9th, maybe a window into the madness. But yes, it's going to be frenzied throughout this week, next week. The weeks to come, I guess we'll find out when it finally dies down. But speaking of frenzy, we've got a frenzy of comments and responses. Let's see what you guys had to say. People said this. Good Lord, people, it's a hamburger from the other bill. This person says, the long wait for the first in and out in Idaho is a testament to what I have learned from living in Idaho for over 70 years. Don't hold your breath for good things. The rest of the country has to come to Idaho because you might suffocate while waiting for it to get here. That's from Steve. Uh, this person says, or aren't our guts and butts big enough? <laughs> okay. Don said, for a state that despises Californians, it's interesting to see how many Idahoans are waiting eight hours for a burger that originated in California. Deb said, imagine the number of vaccinations and voter registrations you could accomplish just walking through the parking lot. Matt and Boise said, Meanwhile, people in Krispy Kreme look across the street at the lines at In-N-Out and recall the early 2000s. Remember that? In-N-Out openings, they were just as big of a deal back 20 years ago. Then Lori asked a question on a lot of your minds. What is animal style referring to at In-N-Out? Well, Lori, I got to tell you, uh, the not-so-secret menu includes animal style, which is extra spread, also known as their, their pinkish sauce. And then they put on grilled onions, and then you can add that to your burger or fries. I think they put on some extra cheese as well. And then there are people like James who have their go-tos already locked in, like hamburger habit. My goodness, 
or Pat, who said, we had In-N-Out burgers and my wife and I can't understand the frenzy. There's been a better burger waiting at the Big Bun since 1958. Oh yeah, that's a long time local. We also have Randy who said, I'll put a Grumpy's burger up against In-N-Out anytime. And then Joe from Eagle, not me, they summed it all up saying, In-N-Out, see you in February. Well, we haven't seen much accumulating snowfall in about the past week or so, but it's still making for beautiful views, just like in those pictures and in this view from McCall, you can see the snow in the foreground there. And you can also see another thing that we have been seeing over the past week is some fog. It's particularly over these areas of bodies of water. We can see this fog form, but thankfully, as we went into the afternoon hours, we saw that clear, though we did still have some higher cloud cover above us as moisture streams in from the southwest. So as you plan your weekend, just know we're going to be expecting some pretty similar conditions. So for valley locations, we've got still the clouds lingering to highs in the 40s and the lows in the 20s. And as we look towards the mountains, kind of a similar picture where we'll see those similar conditions. So those temps are, will be closer to the upper 30s and low 40s. And as we get into Sunday, those, uh, well, those mountain temperatures will actually be very similar to valley temperatures. But as you make your plans, just please know that we also have some considerable avalanche risk as we go towards the sawtooth areas. So just keep that in mind as you make your plans and please be careful. But 
We still have this high pressure ridge that is firmly in place across the region, but we are getting a little bit more dry air, which is why we saw more sunshine today. And we're sticking with this pattern all the way until Monday, where we start to see that ridge break down and a low pressure center continues to move in. And so as we look through the weekend, you can see again those temperatures in the 40s. And then as we look towards Monday and Tuesday and even Wednesday, we see a couple more chances of showers. All right, let's take a look at some of your comments to wrap up the week. This person says, maybe instead of going directly to removal of the lower Snake River dams, we should stop commercial fishing of salmon and see what happens. That insight from Bill Jay. This person says the science has been in for years on the benefits of the Snake River Dam removal for salmon. These dams delay out migration of smolts, provide habitat for predators, increase water temps to lethal levels, etc. That's from Rick and Eagle. This person says, don't people realize thousands of acres of farmland depend on the dams, breach them, and who's going to grow our food? Kurt, that's a good point. A lot of other comments coming in. I know that the, the Snake River Dams and the situation with the fish, our team will continue to follow it. It's complicated, but we'll do our best to walk you through it. All right, we'll see you on Monday. Have a great weekend.